Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. This is episode 7 in the ongoing countdown in the John Bonet Ramsey case. The countdown really starts gathering momentum sort of from tomorrow, from the 17th of December. And that is when the, the events in the countdown sort of happen on a day-by-day sort of basis. I do think, nevertheless, you're going to find this episode quite riveting. The question is, you know, what can tabloid reporters contribute to high-profile cases? And I think the answer is a mixed bag. And um, that's a very short answer to a very big story in terms of they can contribute a lot of um, insight. They can contribute a lot of... um, clues and you know observations like literally having an army of detectives running around at the same time instead of one detective you've got many and so you kind of have this omniscience right this kind of almost godlike ability of different people seeing things all over the place and i'm going to illustrate that kind of in a moment the benefits of that but also the um the flip side the the disadvantages and um, in terms of first-hand observations to some extent, how you can be um, misled by your own bias potentially. And then also there's the impact that media in the kind of saturation media, media, lots of reporters running around, the impact that they can have on kind of power struggles on uh, people in power, people in positions of power, whether it's political figures, whether it is uh, lead investigators or lead detectives. We're going to go into all of that in this episode. If you haven't subscribed yet to this channel, you can click on the icon at the bottom right, like, share, leave a comment, and let's get started. So you may have noticed that thus far I've been relying fairly heavily on one one account of the Ramsey case. And that is Lauren Schiller's book, Perfect Murder, Perfect Town. Now what's great about this book is it is a very encyclopedic compilation collection of a heck of a lot of statements by a heck of a lot of people. So... It is very thorough, it is very complete, it is very, uh, it kind of includes everything, right? My criticism of the book is that it doesn't try to investigate the case, it doesn't try to express an opinion about the case. And I believe that this was done on purpose to allow access to, maximum access to the maximum number of people. So in other words, if the book had come in with a position of um, the Ramses are guilty, it would probably be as half as thick as it is. If it came in with a position that an intruder was responsible and only an intruder, it would also be half as thick as, as it is. The book actually kind of starts the quote that talks about evils before the world are not nearly so often caused by bad men as they are by good men who are silent when an opinion must be voiced. And I just find that really ironic because um, an opinion isn't really voiced in this narrative. It, it sort of maintains a neutral territory, a neutral perspective. Before I go into the description or the letter that Ed Shapiro wrote to the author in Perfect Murder, Perfect Town. I want to refer you to an article in the Denver Post. It is from February 17. I think it's 2000. So just more than 20 years ago. And the title of the article is Book Feud Erupted First Day. And It's referring there to a feud between police and prosecutors investigating John Bonet Ramsey's death. Now, what are we talking about when we talk about that? We're talking about both the police and the prosecutors are tasked kind of with the same thing. And they should, all things being equal, be on the same side. So 
typically the cops and the prosecutors are on the same team and they both prosecute, they investigate and prosecute a case based on who they think is responsible. And so what this feud is already alluding to is that the police, who were the investigators on the ground, believed that there was some reason to suspect the Ramses or a member of the Ramsey family, whereas the prosecutors, including the district attorney, Alex Hunter, they didn't want to go down that route. They wanted the police to investigate other possibilities. But the police didn't want to investigate other possibilities because they thought they knew kind of what was going on, hence the feud. The second paragraph of the article, and as I said, I'll put it in the description, does very clearly state that Lauren Schiller doesn't attempt to solve the two-year-old mystery of who killed the former Little Miss Colorado. So at this point it was two years old, perhaps a little bit more than two years old. Um, but what they say, is it does offer a glimpse inside the investigation that began December 26, 1996. The article goes on to say, from the outset, investigators were skeptical that a kidnapping had occurred. In other words, they didn't buy the ransom note. And there was a good reason not to buy the contents of the ransom note. Um, they It's described as a rambling ransom note and referred in the book, uh, referred to in the book as the war and peace of ransom notes. So, so the ransom note really stuck out as something strange, something kind of very elaborate, something um, much longer and more descriptive than people had really seen before. So you might think that the there was something wrong with the police, that the police were too focused on whatever they were focused on, they were too fixated, they weren't flexible enough, they were inflexible. But the FBI had the same feeling that the police did. And this article talks about the FBI's decision to leave Boulder in disgust, angry over the DA's desire to interview the Ramses before taking the case to a grand jury. And according to this article, which is in turn sort of interpreting the contents of the book, FBI agents thought the Ramses should be interviewed by the grand jury with a threat of perjury hanging over their heads, according to the book. So you have the FBI and the police kind of um, in solidarity, not very happy with the district attorney and with the prosecution side of things. Now, if you just look at the numbers there, you've, you've got to ask yourself, do you, which, which side do you think is likely unreasonable? If the FBI of, feel the way that they do, if the police feel that the way that they do, and of course the lead detective resigned in disgust. Um, who do you think may, be, may have been misbehaving or, or kind of acting in a, a strange way in this case? And then another question would be, why? I'm not going to go through the entire article. I'll leave it to you to read. As I say, it's in the description. A part that I do want to emphasize, and I'm quoting from the article, the underlying theme throughout the book, and that's Perfect Murder, Perfect Town, is the rift between police and prosecutors. It grew so bitter, according to the book, that police were withholding evidence from prosecutors and Hunter traded information with a tabloid reporter. The DA also enlisted the reporter's help to discredit the lead detective on the case, according to the book. And it goes on just to talk about conflict of interest and you actually needed to take... Uh, the district attorney off the case if that was the if that was the case um, anyway I'm not going to go on uh, further but this kind of brings up this whole subject of Jeff Shapiro and Jeff Shapiro is the unnamed tabloid reporter that they're referring to and what what is going on here is that Alex Hunt is trading information so he's giving insight clues um, directives, whatever you want to call it, to kind of a civilian, an outsider, a member of the press, a member of the media. And in exchange for that, he's, he's sort of asking for the reporter to help him to discredit the lead detective. Now we're going to deal 
in some detail with Jeff Shapiro. Uh, we're going to get to him in his own words in terms of where he is today and, you know, the whole arc of the story in due course. But before we get there, I want to go into Perfect Murder, Perfect Town and just briefly highlight some of Shapiro's observations to Lauren Schiller, right, in Perfect Murder, Perfect Town. Now, what I want you to concentrate on is this whole question of can tabloid reporters kind of add value to an investigation? And I find that question quite interesting from the perspective of a true crime author, from an investigative photojournalist, from somebody who's completely outside. So you're not a police officer, you're not a prosecutor, you're not part of the inner circle of either the victim's family or possibly related to the perpetrator. You're just an outsider. Can you add value to an investigation? I know what the answer is, just from experience investigating a lot of cases, writing about a lot of cases, being in the courtroom in a lot of cases, um, and all that kind of thing. Um, but this is the version from uh, Jeff Shapiro, and I'm quoting from page 330 and 331 of Perfect Murder, Perfect Town. And he talks about Alex Hunter becoming his commander-in-chief, and that he, he, this is Jeff Shapiro, and he was a tabloid reporter employed by The Globe, which is a huge tabloid, and um, which covered the Ramsey case exhaustively. And um, he said that he started to think of stories that he was going to write in terms of what Hunter said, in terms of what the prosecutor was saying to him, rather than in terms of what his editors wanted. So he was kind of, I mean, this was the biggest story in America. I think it was the biggest story in American true crime history until that point. And arguably, it's still one of the biggest cases America's ever had. And so this reporter found himself in this weird position where he was so close to the story that the district attorney, which is like the font of information, was actually talking to him quite frankly about things that were going on. But it was a quid pro quo. The district attorney also wanted something from him. Well, what? So he says that if Hunter had a theory, it, that was something that he wanted to pursue. And I think this was in March 1997. So we are only about three months after the fact, so quite early on. He called Pam Griffin, John Bernays' patron seamstress, um, and he, he wanted to know about what was in the ransom note. So at this point, the contents of the ransom note wasn't known. And so he specifically asked Pam Griffin, were the words foreign faction used in the ransom note? And he didn't say whether Hunter told him that. He didn't say that Hunter said... Um, something about a ransom note and you know we, we're trying to find out about a foreign faction but reading between the lines I wouldn't be surprised if Hunter let that slip or kind of told him about it and now he's trying to investigate that aspect so that is the the line that he's he's going down this tabloid reporter now this is my opinion that is a like a dead end. I mean, it's something that is, that would have been kind of a scoop in the Ramsey case, the contents of the ransom note. In other words, that wasn't known then. So for some of the contents to be leaked would be a story, right, at that point in time. But of course, talking about foreign faction and the, the actual merits of the case if you were in charge of it, you'd think, well, that, that's kind of harmless. It's going to be a harmless sideshow. It's not going to take them in the direction that the case actually needs to go. Does that make sense? And so I think, um, according to him, Pam Griffin uh, thought that that might be the case, that foreign faction might be in the ransom note. And then he was contacted by a reporter, or he contacted a reporter 
from the Daily Camera, Ali Krupski, and she'd heard from a cop that the word Iran was also in the note, and we know that that's not true. Iran is never mentioned in the note, and so you can see now how a little bit of a seed planted in the reporter's mind is now going in a very, very quickly in the direction of conspiracy theory. And I don't think, I think Ali Kripsky is a great reporter, but it would be interesting to know which cop talked about this thing about Iran, Iran, right? And so this reporter, Jeff Shapiro, really investigated this angle. He, he called the director of the International Institute for the Study of Terrorism. And um, and so Shapiro found out the name of a death squad, missionaries of Iran, Iran um, and found out that what these people do is they strangle people and occasionally behead them. And so now he is putting things together. And of course, he's going completely down the wrong rabbit hole, right? And, um, and so obviously he wrote about that. And he, he wrote up his theory. He gave it to lots of different people. And of course, this is how rumors spread and get entranced. Um, and he was hoping that even the Ramses would hear about it. And, and that this theory would also ingratiate him with the Ramses and that they would kind of want to talk to him and give him an interview. Interestingly, he says the story was never intended for publication. Um, I'm not going to take you through everything. He, he goes to Fleet White and Fleet White doesn't want to talk to him. And, he, and um, then he takes, faxes a copy to Pam Griffin, uh, Denise Wolf, uh, John Ramsey's secretary. Uh, she gave it to John. And apparently John was quite dismissive of it, which makes sense. And then uh, Patsy's mother, Nidra, believed it entirely. And I think that also kind of makes sense that the if you just think of the pageantry of the poor side of the family and this farcical theory, oh, no, no, that makes complete sense. Anyway, if we... I'm going to just jump to the bottom of page 331, not really quoting this verbatim, just sort of glo glossing through it. He refers to um, attending church and when he sat down on his left in the row right in front of him were Patsy and John and this I think is just fascinating he says Burke was sitting with the Steins near me and he had to look away because he didn't want to draw attention to himself meaning he didn't want to cat he didn't want them to catch him looking at them and of course he was a newcomer to the church and it was kind of a quite a close knit community and the clo quite a close knit congregation and so who are you what are you doing here and of course he is kind of the enemy he's a tabloid reporter he's not in church to worship god or to for fellowship he's there to sort of spy and what is interesting is he says what he observed what he observed was burke was and this is a quote from the book burke was happy as a clam hopping around with a friend. This is in March 1997. So Burke was um, observed in church looking very happy. And the same thing applies at the funeral. People said that Burke didn't really seem to realize what was going on. He didn't seem upset. But the part that I want to em emphasize is on page 332 where... Shapiro kind of notices Patsy ardently praying and she seems to be saying under her breath while praying, please, please, over and over again. And he says that it seemed to him that she was asking for forgiveness and he'd never seen anyone praying as fervently as she seemed to be praying. And the way that she was just saying it over and over again, um, he looked into Patsy's eyes, he watched him taking communion, and she was just the whole time saying, please, please. Um, he, he says, Jeff Shapiro writes, that was when I felt in my heart that she had murdered John Bonet. 
Now, let me just say, I don't think either of John Bonet's parents were involved in harming her. But here you have a reporter who's suddenly convinced, and he was not the only one. There are quite a few people who subscribed to the Patsy did a theory, including the lead detective, Steve Thomas. And then he talks about the the Reverend Hoverstock. I think he actually attended, he was sort of called to the crime scene to help mourn. You know, John Bonet has been kidnapped, according to the story, but they're crying as though... I mean, wh- why would you send for your, your, your reverend or your pastor? And what is quite interesting is, is he talks about the reverend in the church uh, walking down the aisle, hugging and kissing everyone, but then he avoids Patsy. And so the reporter also looked into this. And when he saw this, his jaw dropped, he said. And he said, I realized that the harvest stock had to believe Patsy was involved. And then, right at the end, he wrote, right at the end of his letter on page 333, I wrote a story about that Sunday, the Ramsey's private hell, but it was never published. So I can tell you that I really appreciate that insight. I, you know, you, you now have a reporter who's in church and you're getting this first-hand account of what he's seeing in the same way that you get the same kind of first-hand account of the funeral from Steve Thomas who's also in the church but at the at the funeral I think he was at the memorial service as well but I'm not 100% clear on that I know there was a incident between Steve Thomas and John Andrew that is in Steve Thomas's book Now I'm going to take you to the Washington Post and it is a story dated April 8th, 1999, Globe Editors Tripped Up by Own Reporters. So it's possible that this Denver Post article actually came out in February 1999, not February 2000. So I'm just going to, again, I will put the article in the description. I think it is worth reading, but the part I want to highlight is the part where they're talking about how a tabloid reporter was sort of recruited to undermine the lead detective. Now the impression I get from this Washington Post article is that Alex Hunter or somebody wanted Jeff Shapiro to find out information about the lead detective Steve Thomas and then use this to pressure him to give an interview. In other words, if you don't give this interview, we're going to write a story that you wouldn't want about your family and so that is going to kind of be it's going to kind of force him to tell the story and of course if he does that he'll probably be thrown off the investigation anyway because you know he would have spoken to the media and and he wasn't allowed to so it's kind of a a lose-lose situation for the detective if he doesn't say something he gets undermined by the story that is told about his family and if he does say something The investigation is undermined, so you must make a choice. And so now I'm sure you want to know what was this information, whatever you want to call it, this dirt on Steve Thomas or on his family. It's actually quite tragic. It's actually quite sad. And it just shows you how dirty and nasty this whole business was getting. So I'm just referring to a section in the article. It talks about the file assembled by the Globe included information about Thomas's late mother. So in other words, his mother... Um, was no longer alive, but it was information about her. And this information really upset the, the the detective. And it was a package containing pictures of his mother, and it was actually sent to Thomas in an effort to get him to play ball. And that is from Steve Thomas's lawyer. And apparently Steve Thomas was devastated by what he saw. He was upset, and it was all about the possibility that his mother had committed suicide. Steve Thomas was six years old when he lost his mother, And so I think the thing that was kind of going on here was um, a little bit, and I could be wrong, I could be misreading this, but it seemed like the allegation that was sort of being made was if Steve Thomas's mother committed suicide, he may have kind of a, a bone to pick with all mothers. He may have felt, bear in mind, he was six when he lost his mother, right? And John Bonet was six when she died. So he may be subconsciously blaming the mother in this situation for what, what happened. And I think there is a little bit of truth to that. I think there 
is quite a lot of projection. But at the same time, there was a lot coming from Patsy that you could say legitimately, um, or let me put it another way, sensibly, that, that, that some people would be led to believe certain things. So I'll give an example. The handwriting of the ransom note was somewhat like Patsy's handwriting, and pa Patsy was ambidextrous. She could write with both hands. And, you know, she was the one who gave five handwriting samples, not one. It wasn't as though she wrote one sample and it was excluded. And there's quite a lot to say about Patsy's handwriting, but the point that I just want to make is that um, all of this was something that Steve Thomas didn't really want. And it wasn't just because of that aspect. It was at the time he was worried about the impact of this and other family information on his father who had just suffered a heart attack. So he didn't want to stress his father with this sort of media scourge of something about his mother committing suicide. And so you can really sympathize with the lead detective, right? But can you see what a dirty business this was becoming where the district attorney was apparently uh, exercising leverage over the lead detective through the media and although uh, Steve Thomas's response by his lawyer was that it was all a lie in other words his mother hadn't committed suicide um, it was still enough to have an impact and so you know there is some truth in the sort of this whole thing that, that's kind of what I'm getting at is so when Jeff Shapiro saw Patsy praying, pleading with God in church. What do you think that was all about? If Patsy wasn't responsible, why would she be praying like that? And that is kind of what I'm getting at is that I think there's some truth and some value in what a tabloid reporter can uncover. But he may, the tabloid reporter himself may not necessarily know that because he's not an investigator. He's not a, he doesn't have experience with, uh, a lot of experience with criminal cases. But having said that, what is very interesting with Jeff Shapiro is that he went on to become a very respected and respectable uh, prosecutor. Right now he's a practicing American attorney and nationally recognized investigative journalist. He currently writes legal analysis for the Washington Times and previously served as a criminal prosecutor in Washington, D.C. And you can read about Jeffrey Scott Shapiro's bio on Wikipedia. I'll put a link to that. And um, he's currently, I think he works for, the, for a law firm called Noble Lawyering. So my impression is that Jeff Shapiro kind of went from what he was doing, the sort of tabloid reporting, and he got a law degree about five or six years later. So he probably went into law school very shortly after that, found that he had an aptitude for it and an interest in it. And But the point that I kind of want to make is that this was a tabloid reporter who had the intellectual ability to be a, a lawyer, right? And I must say that is quite rare because I've worked as a journalist. I've worked in a newsroom. I've worked with journalists. I've sat in court uh, with journalists on either side of me. And I don't mean to be nasty, but my kind of impression is that they've just been to journalism school. They've been taught how to write. And as far as I'm concerned, that's kind of a basic skill that everyone should have. I'm a self-taught writer. I never went to journalism school. I studied lots of other things. I studied law, I studied quantity surveying, I studied business, I studied economics, I've got a marketing diploma, but I ended up becoming an investigative reporter and writing books in the end. But my, the point that I'm trying to make is a lot of journalists aren't very well educated. They are quite well informed, so that they may know a lot about what is going on. And if they're covering a case, they may have kind of an expert knowledge of what's going on. But the question is, can they interpret that knowledge? And without some kind of education, that's debatable. And it also depends on how intelligent they are as reporters. Now, Jeff Shapiro is a good example of a guy who isn't an, a slouch. He, he knew what he was doing. And I think the district attorney, Alex Hunter, recognized his kind of nous, right? His sort of aptitude. But at the same time, he was quite a young guy. And so when he was in, in church observing Patsy, it was like the penny dropped. 
And that's a very difficult thing to, you can't kind of just observe someone and know that they've done something. And I do think some of what he was seeing was at a basis intuitively. So in other words, that he wasn't wrong. He wasn't completely wrong. But I don't think, I mean, I think he did later accept that Patsy wasn't involved. And you can actually read about that on Jeff Shapiro's blog. I think it's called Drink This. And I'll just quickly quote from that blog. He talks about, I developed a cozy professional relationship with Boulder District Attorney Alex Hunter, who allowed me routine access to his office. Now, let me just ask you a question. If you think about your knowledge and experience of high-profile cases like Michael Rourke in the Chris Watts case, also the district attorney in the Patrick Frazee case, and so on, do you think that they, do they have cozy relationships with reporters? Or is there a sense that they don't actually talk to reporters, that they hold the reporters often at bay until the case is finalized, and then they might have a press conference? So this thing where the the court case hasn't actually happened and there's a cozy relationship not just with um, like a recognized reporter from like a legal reporter and legal reporters are almost like a level above tabloid reporters or often not always but this guy was almost like a, a new reporter and working for a tabloid right and now he's got a cozy relationship with the district attorney and the case hasn't even gone to trial don't you find that a bit odd Anyway, to quote from his blog, he says, The top prosecutor, meaning Alex Hunter, told me he was concerned that the police were too convinced of John and Patsy Ramsey's guilt. And as a result, no one was chasing other leads. And so this is what the district attorney wanted to, wanted this tabloid reporter to do. He wanted to send him in that direction, right? Which was something that suited the district attorney, but it was it true was it the way that the investigation needed to go and then he said i had already spent a year investigating the ramses so this reporter had kind of intuitively investigated the ramses because that was what made sense to him and he talks about working undercover in the family's church interviewing their friends and even traveling to john ramsey's hometown to piece together his childhood so jeffrey shapiro went to a lot of effort you can see he was a a thorough guy, a guy who, um, you know, got to the bottom of a story, right? And then in this blog post, he says, I still had my suspicions about Patsy, the former Miss West Virginia, but based on many months of research, I wasn't convinced she could have committed this brutal and ritualistic killing. And so that is kind of what he, so although he initially suspected Patsy, as many people fairly new to the Ramsey case do, he later changed his mind. He had a kind of a change of heart or change of mind. I'm just trying to see if I can find the date of this particular blog post. But I will put it up on in the description as well. Okay, so it was, this blog post was originally published in the Boulder Weekly on December 20th, 2001. So, as early as 2001, he'd already changed his mind about Patsy. Shapiro signs off saying, I firmly believe this case will be solved. He says, what I think about the identity of John Bonet's killer is that people are strange. Society is strange. And truth is so much stranger than fiction. And I think that is a great way to end uh, our little um, coverage of Jeff Shapiro. I differ a little bit from Jeff Shapiro in Jeff seemed to have a lot of respect for Alex Hunter and thought that Alex Hunter really knew what was going on. I don't think that that's not the case, but um, I differ a little bit that that um, Shapiro seemed to think that Alex Hunter was genuinely pursuing the truth. And I think the way that he used Jeff Shapiro I don't know if that is something that uh, someone involved in the practice of law should be doing. I could be wrong. I mean, what do you think about it? Bear in mind, this was a case that ultimately uh, has been a legal failure. So do you think that the Ramsey case is an example of how to prosecute a case or how not to prosecute a case? Is the way to prosecute a case that you, you kind of 
go to the media and you have them investigate your lead detective. Is that the way to do it? The prosecutors I've met in court virtually never speak to the media. The defense lawyers sometimes do, but the prosecutors never do, unless it's something very egregious that needs to be, where the record needs to be set straight. But there's, there's no kind of discussion with the media until the case is done. And even then, sometimes they don't talk to the media. A good example is Harry Nell in the Oscar Pistorius trial. You uh, sometimes have documentaries on the Oscar Pistorius trial, and you hear a little bit from the defense attorney. You will almost never hear from the prosecutor. For those interested in the Chris Watts case, I know I've been promising that I will do a little bit of statement analysis on the written statement that he wrote and handed in to... Um, gave to FBI agent Graham Coder on Tuesday night. I'll be doing that following this episode, so look out for that. Again, if you haven't subscribed yet to the channel, please do. Like, share, leave a comment, and I'll see you guys next time.